Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast, providing quick and innovative ways to make the absolute most out of your research time and creative ideas for sharing and displaying your family history. I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Welcome to episode 27 of the Genealogy Gems Podcast. I'm back from the beautiful state of Utah, where I participated in the Northern Utah Genealogy Jamboree in Ogden. It was a whirlwind trip. My husband and I left Thursday night when he got home from work, and we stayed over in Nevada and rolled into Salt Lake City around noon on Friday. It was sort of a repeat of the Our Summer Vacation video that I did um, as we raced through three quick hours at the Family History Library collecting books that don't circulate to the regional libraries. And as I plowed through them, my husband got to know the copy machine very well indeed. So by dinner time, we were able to happily walk out with an armload of materials that will um, hopefully push some of the family lines even further back. Then it was up to Ogden, which is a beautiful town. It's nestled at the foot of those grand mountains. And the conference was from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. on Saturday. I had an exhibit booth there, and it was my first one ever for Genealogy Gems. And I was just overwhelmed by the response of the visitors to the booth. It's obvious that podcasting is still very new to many people. And yet they were so interested and they were willing to learn about this new technology and that brings genealogy to their ears, if you will. Um, we just had a wonderful time. And I want to extend my thanks once again to Kimberly Savage and Holly Hansen, who run My Ancestors Found, which is the organization that put on the conference. They did an amazing job and they were just so gracious and helpful. I really appreciate all their help and all their hard work. Then Sunday, we were up at 5.30 in the morning to hit the road and get home to California before dinner. It was a very, very fast-paced weekend, but a very productive one. And I had a chance to talk one-on-one -on -one with several really interesting people in the world of genealogy. And today's episode will feature one of those conversations. And I feel sure that you uh, probably will know my guest and will enjoy this up-close and personal interview. But before we reveal her identity, let's get to the mailbox. from Danny in Baltimore. And Danny writes, I'm new to your podcast, enjoying the show, and I am busy playing catch up and recently listened to your episode dealing with the Freedom of Information Act and naturalization records, and I felt compelled to write. I had the best experience and found a gold mine when I requested my father's military records. As you've noted, a grandson is not next of kin, but I sent my request anyway and a very helpful and nice archivist at the MPRC, which is the Military Personnel Records Center, in St. Louis, emailed me with the bad news. Because the file was one of the larger files, and he felt that I would not benefit from the minimal information he could provide, uh, he offered me an option to fax him a letter from my father authorizing the release of the records. With the faxed authorization, he would gladly comply. My father and uncles all signed a letter which I faxed, and would you know it, a month later a package with a three-inch thick file showed up at my house. I spent months going through the data, and the following Christmas created a wonderful storybook about my grandfather's naval exploits that I mailed to my father and his brothers. Since my grandfather married after he retired from the Navy, he spent 20 years at sea, no one knew anything. One uncle was so thrilled that he prominently displayed the storybook for all to see at a Christmas open house party. And that's from Danny from Baltimore. What a wonderful story. Uh, the Freedom of Information Act is such an asset to us as genealogists, and 
hopefully this will inspire more of you to take the plunge and go ahead and give it a shot. And if they can't fulfill your request, maybe they will give you some creative options to help you get it fulfilled. And I got a note from Diana Larson. And she says, thank you so much for talking about the worldvitalrecords.com newspaper archive. I wasn't able to listen to that podcast until this evening. So I figured that I would be too late to benefit from the free access. And we talked about that those files are usually available for about 10 days for free when they're first put up on the website. She says, but I thought I would check out the website anyway. Good plan. Fortunately for me, there are a ton of newspapers from Waterloo, Iowa which is where one half of my family lived and still lives. The first result I discovered upon entering a family name search was my grandfather's birth announcement from 1913. Thank you so much for sharing this wonderful resource with all of us. Well, you're welcome, Diana. I love hearing the success stories. I checked the World Vital Records website today, and there are many more newly added databases that have that 10-day free access. I think we should all be checking regularly to see what's new and what's free. It's very easy to figure out on the website because they have a large box on the left-hand side of the home page, and it's called Recently Added Databases. And they offer them for, again, that 10-day free um, trial when they're first added. So right now there are lots of new Minnesota databases, so I know I'm going to be doing a lot of browsing over the next few days. And I have a tip for you. When you go to World Vital Records and you find that newly added databases box, go down to the bottom of it and click on the link that says browse all recently added databases. It's at the bottom of that box on the home page. There are hundreds of new databases that are all currently free. So if you're in a hurry and you have some keywords that you're looking for, such as let's say the name of a town or a surname, Here's a very quick way to find those keywords in one of the hundreds of titles that are listed there. You're going to do a find on the page search. And the way to do this is from the home page, click on the browse all recently added databases link. And from the top of the page that it takes you to that has the entire listing of databases, press the control key and the letter E key, E like Edward, that's on your keyboard at the same time. And this will help you access the edit menu. Press the letter F, like Frank, on your keyboard to access find on this page. That's the function you'll be using. And this will make the find window pop up. And all you have to do is type your keyword in the search box in the find window and click the next button. If a Windows Internet Explorer window pops up saying, you know, there's no text found, that just means that your keyword doesn't appear in any of the listings on that page. So you just click the OK button to make that disappear, and you can try searching your next keyword in the Find box. Now, in my case, I searched Minnesota. The page is going to jump to the first listing that's on the page with the word Minnesota highlighted. And to see if there are any more listings with your keyword, just click the Next button again in the Find window, and the next appearance of your keyword will be highlighted on the page. Now, an important thing to remember about the Find function is that if you go through several found listings, say for the word um, Minnesota, it will start over again at the top. Once you've gone through to the bottom, it's going to go back up to the top and then just start going down the page again and showing you Minnesota in the different listings. And it will just kind of keep going in a circle. So once you realize that you've looked at all the Minnesota listings, let's say, you'll want to search another keyword, right? Well, be sure to go back up to the top of the page before you do your next search. Otherwise, it will only start searching from the place where you left off on your last search, and it gets a little bit confusing. So to get back to the top, just click anywhere on the page, you know, where there's not a hyperlink, so that you've accessed the page, and then press the home key on your keyboard. And this will jump you right back up to the top, and now you're ready to enter your next keyword in the find box. Now this find feature, find a keyword on a web page, that I'm talking about, this feature can be used on any web page. So make a habit of using techniques like this and you will save a great deal of time and research and you'll just get more comfortable with it. It will become kind of a second nature. 
because that's one of our goals. It's to make the most out of your research time. And the find feature is going to save you a lot of time. And finally, I have an email here from Judy Gorman from Tennessee. She says, hi, Lisa. I absolutely love the podcast and really enjoy your fun tips. Thank you, Judy. And especially the one about the Sweet Memories candy bar. I am doing them for Christmas, and I also bought the book for the first year. What I want to ask is this. I do not have an iPod, so I download the podcast into iTunes and burn them on discs. They are really great for traveling, but I would like to donate them to my genealogical society after listening to them, the Tennessee Genealogical Society here in Memphis, Tennessee. They said that they would like to have them, so I began to make labels, and some of the people will not know what podcasts are, and I wanted a nice picture to put in the label. I tried to get a picture of you, oh, you don't want that, from the summer vacation video, but I couldn't. So is it legal or acceptable to put the picture from the cover of your book onto the labels with the name Genealogy Gems and the date of the podcast? Should I include your name? And she ends with, by the way, my grown daughter, who has no interest in genealogy, And her nine-year-old son absolutely loved the socks video. They laughed and laughed and even emailed it to their friends. And that's from Judy Gorman. Well, Judy, sweet memories. The candy bar was a real favorite of mine, and I was a little uncertain if that project would be of interest to the listeners, so I'm really pleased to hear that you enjoyed it and you're going to be doing them yourself. Gosh, it's, you know, it's late September. We're already having to be thinking about getting ready for Christmas, huh? And thank you for checking with me about the labels. It is really considerate of you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, add a link in the show notes to a label that I've created. Now, I use um, a product called CD Stomper to make labels for CDs. And um, I hope it'll work for you. It's a standard CD CD label size. Um, But I'm going to have it there uh, in a link in the show notes so that any of you, and I know many of you do burn CDs that you can listen to them in your car or, you know, in other places where you're not at your computer. And that's great. And I think it'd be a wonderful idea to put them to good use when you're done if you want to pass them on to a genealogical society. So I would just ask that you would use this label because it's all ready to go. I've got the Genealogy Gems logo on there and my name and uh, the website So that when somebody listens to it, hopefully they'll be able to look at the disc and find the website and and be able to go from there to subscribe on their own. That would be terrific. So I will put that together and have a link for you on the show notes. Thank you for the idea, for sharing it with the society. That's a great idea. And um, I hope that they enjoy it. And of course, for all of you, please let your societies know that they are welcome to use um, excerpts from my Genealogy Gems podcast newsletter in their society newsletter. Um, If you haven't already subscribed to it, it's free. You can get that on the website. Just click on the newsletter button and it'll uh, instruct you to to send me an email with your uh, name and your state and how you heard about the podcast. Uh, But I put it out every month and your emails are kept confidential and private. They're just for the use of, of this show. But I know that many societies who put together a newsletter, sometimes it can become a real challenge to come up with some material to fill in some of the blanks. And all I ask is that you have them include a credit that says by Lisa L. Cook, the Genealogy Gems podcast, and the website. And that way people will know where it came from and and can be able to access the website as well. So I I I know that societies are always looking for that extra filler information. So that's terrific. And you made my day, Judy, when you shared the story about your daughter and your grandson enjoying the Socks to America video. Uh, If you haven't seen this video already, um, go to the website, click on the Genealogy Gems TV page or the videos button, and you'll find it listed under comedies. I actually have a link directly from the homepage to the Socks to America video. It's just been taking off. It's been crazy. In fact, last week while I was at the conference, I got an email from rootstelevision.com. And they said that they really enjoyed the video, and they actually featured it on their homepage for the weekend, which was great. And I know that Og, their blogger over there at Roots TV, um, has been blogging about it. So it's really exciting to me to know that uh, people are finding it funny and enjoying sharing it with their friends. That's the whole idea. You know, that was really my goal, to create something that would interest genealogists and non-genealogists alike, and perhaps you know, pique the interest of family members in what we family historians are up to. So um, anyway, I 
my thanks to Ritz Television for featuring the video, and uh, you can find it at Ritz Television under their Roots Living section, as well as I think it's under Roots Tube, the Roots Tube channel, and of course at my website. Coming up next is the interview that I promised you from someone that I think you're going to know. Last weekend at the conference in Utah, it was my pleasure to um, finally meet face-to-face Dear Myrtle. And she is just a lovely lady. And it was so funny because the two of us were, you know, like, I I don't recognize your face, but I know the voice. I know it's you. And we just had a wonderful time um, chatting. And I just thought it would be fun to share that one-on-one conversation that I got to have with her with you because um, if you're not familiar by any chance with Dear Myrtle, um, she has a wonderful website at dearmyrtle.com and she has her um, audio podcast, which you can find in iTunes along with Genealogy Gems. Um, She has her blog, which is pretty much almost a daily blog that she does. And of course, a a couple of wonderful books. I'm going to have links for all of that in the episode notes for you. Um, But she has just been in the genealogy biz for a long time and was really one of the pioneers in the area of um, streaming audio as well as getting into podcasting. So I know very well that you probably have already heard some of her shows and enjoyed her insight. Um, She's a great inspiration to us. And without any further ado, let's just jump right into my conversation with Dear Myrtle. Okay, well, I'm here at the Northern Utah Genealogical Jamboree, right? And who do I have beside me but Dear Myrtle? Well, hello. It's nice to meet you in person. <laughs> I had to close my eyes and be sure it was really you. And you reckon, I know, the same thing with me. It's like I, I walked past your booth, and then I heard the voice went, wait, wait, I missed it. Mm-hmm. How are you, and how is it to be on the other side of the microphone? Quite different, indeed. Most of the time when I interview people, it's via telephone. You know, All like right. when I interviewed Shelly, and she lives in Tel Aviv. And so there's recording equipment and all the cords and everything, but to actually see somebody really is fun. Yeah, and I love this. We're we're, uh, using the iPod microphone. This is the high-tech version of Mm -hmm. interviewing. So now this is my first time exhibiting at a conference, but I'm guessing that you have done this many and many times. Tell us some of your wild experiences, um, folks you meet. You meet the best folks. You'll notice there's a camaraderie, first of all, among all the presenters and vendors. There's just a real esprit de corps. And we are happy to see each other and help each other out. I had trouble setting up when so Bruce Busby from Roots Magic came and helped me and that's just how it is. It's really very it's very cooperative and nice. And then the folks. Yeah. <laughs> You've had fun meeting them, haven't you? Oh, it's been wonderful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they have the same questions you and I had when we started out. And we're not going to be uppity and oses at them. We're going to sit by them and help them and try to fumble through it together and figure out how they can find who those parents are. And that's what's so interesting about what you're doing is I saw your your dear Myrtle booth. You're doing prescriptions. (laughs) People can walk up and say, this is what ails me, Myrt. Help me. And so you've been, what, writing down? Here's the next steps to take? You know, none of us know everything, and it really helps to have somebody else to discuss the problem with. And having the folks be able to attend classes, which they do, we have marvelous presenters, mm-hmm. uh, and then 
it kind of awakens an interest and they're like going to need to start talk sessions and by the by the process of talking it brings some of those recollections to the forefront right and they're finally going to get around to working on that genealogy line that's bugged them for so long now i noticed that about half the time when i would be talking and writing things down the next person in line or the one after that would have a suggestion and so we'd add it to the prescript very round robin and helpful like that so it was kind of fun mm -hmm. it's the same type of community feel that you get I, I don't know you probably feel the same thing when you're doing your podcast and you're getting emails from people and yes. you're learning from them and they're giving you ideas for future episodes oh, yes. and we need that feedback Yes. Um, you know, otherwise we're just looking at that mic and uh, trying to figure out what we mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I had such an occasion last summer when I was so stretched to the limit with my caregiving. Mm -hmm. And I decided to make raspberry jam, which sounds ridiculous, to further extend yourself physically. <laughs> but to me, that was more like the old me before the caregiving. Mm -hmm. So I made raspberry jam and I wrote about it because I have great memories of my real grandmother Mer Myrtle making it. Man, that was one of my most popular series. People wrote and sent me pictures of their grandkids helping. And oh. I tried to incorporate them into some of the subsequent or follow-up um, blogs. And I think it. I think we're all like that. We have times where we're better at doing research, and other times we're exhausted and don't know where to go. And we just kind of need to help each other out. This, this is like a help yes. seminar today. <laughs> Hi, my name is Lisa. I'm a genealogist. Yes, and I'm powerless over paperwork. Yes. <laughs> well, now, I've been podcasting since February, but mm -hmm. how long have you been podcasting? Well... Podcasting, I can't remember podcasting when I actually started. I did internet streaming starting in 2000, January of 2000, which was nice. Wow. A little expensive for the live internet streaming. And then you'd have to store it, and then hard drives cost more money then, and bandwidth cost more. So about, I'd say about 2004... I started doing podcasting, and it was really new Really then. new. It was just they brand only, new. Yeah, they had, like, Apple people doing it, and none of them do it. And I'm, like, trying to find software that could do it, and now it's much easier. Mm -hmm. And my problem is consistency. Yeah. Um, because what I like to do is interview people. I don't have the great speaking voice that you've got. You have a lot of confidence in speaking, and I like to interview people. Yes. So it takes quite a bit of scheduling to get you know, one or two give a variety of topics in an hour presentation. And with the health care of my parents, I haven't been quite as right. as prolific a podcaster as I'd like to be. And yet everybody understands because for the same reasons that we're so passionate about family history, obviously family always comes first. Yes. That was that's one of the first true. things I remember saying in my podcast was, here's my goal, but I got first. <laughs> right. And then from there, you well, know. Well, your podcasters went through your wedding with you yes. and everything of your daughter and and that is very rewarding to get that feedback from our listeners and from our blog readers because um, we want to try to meet their needs and and exactly. talk about the things they're interested in or the challenges they have with research and it's so fun and going now you've had the um, <clears throat> the benefit of the experience of really from ground zero and now you've been doing this for a couple, you know, a couple of years in terms of getting the word out online. Mm -hmm. I can't think of anybody better to find out what do you think the future is in terms <laughs> of people communicating, people learning, people sharing what they know. Facebook um, and YouTube phenomena is incredible. They're called social networks. And <clears throat> some of the genealogy wikis are trying to... Uh, add a component of that social networking with the ability to have an online version of your pedigree and you can invite people to look at it and add notes and scanned images. Um, I think that um, we in the future will just uh, be keeping our documents online, not genealogy documents. I'm saying in the real business world there will be um, virtual private networks where that company will keep those documents online because the person's never in the office to use that particular computer and they right. will be able to pull something up. And I think that's what the family toward in the way of keeping our data online. Okay. So our genealogy software will have will migrate more to that component of being less centric 
or centered on a particular PC and into things that are out on the net so that you can look at it if you take a trip to Sweden and now you find a cousin and you've got to talk. Exactly. So um, by that. The other thing that's so phenomenal is this concept of having the scanned images of these old documents available online at Footnote or Family Search or whoever, anybody else. Everybody's partnering with everybody else. I know. So they're like cooperating. This is a concept. It's like a web. (laughs) Yes, it is. Right? (laughs) Exactly. So having high speed, Mm -hmm. they come prepackaged with your cable so you can watch your basic TV channels. Right. It'll be sort of like that. I could be all wet. We'll find out. We'll see what happens. Where where does Dear Myrtle want to be in all of that? Well, I still like to talk to people. Yeah. You can have all the high-tech gadgets and things in the world, but we really um, are, in, when we meet one-on-one with somebody who has some experience and shares it, I'm, I don't necessarily have all the experience in the world. I just know a heck of a lot of people who do have a great deal of expertise in their area, maybe Scottish research or... You know where to find it. Yes. Yes. It's kind of a good librarian thing, be able to say, it's on shelf 22A. <laughs> well, what your podcast particularly, when, when it went from blog to voice, mm-hmm. is that you do have such an approachable suite you feel like okay this is like my mom coming alongside of me and saying you know okay I'm safe here and she's gonna I can bumble around you know make my mistakes and I know that she'll understand she's been through mm-hmm. it herself and that's yes. what Mert you know I think does it for all of us it's you you're doing okay keep going keep going <laughs> I see dear Myrtle is coming in for the beginner and intermediate uh-huh. because um if we all went to the a, a National Genealogical Society conference, um, right off the bat, we'd give up because right. people are very experienced and very particular yeah. and very good at citing sources. People can hardly use the words yet. Can't even spell genealogy. Yes. <laughs> There's no O in the middle of that. <laughs> but um, there need to be the standard bearers mm-hmm. and there need to be There needs also to be those like me and others that kind of help you reach along that way toward that goal where you are having a um, and and well analyzed family history that you've compiled. You know, you've got to learn to crawl before you can walk. And so I'm in that kind of beginner to intermediate niche. I think that's great. You know, one of my um, passions is trying to excite the next generation about their family history and you know we all work so hard on it and you wonder are my kids going to happen to it you know when I'm gone and um, I know some of my silly humiliating little videos that I do and I put them out there on YouTube or whatever but part of the concept was you know you never know who might stumble across something like that go what are they talking about Mm -hmm. do you have any tips for how do you (laughs) excite and, and pull in even if the next generation is 35 years old. I you mean, mean you know. a side back and yeah. stringing them up high until they say, yes, they'll take this family history. Right. I don't know. I, I'm really lucky. My granddaughter came last night. I'm staying at her house. She insisted on coming. She's only in second grade. She loves to come to these seminars, and she helped me set up my booth area. Aww. So I don't know. Sometimes you're just lucky. I don't know. But... I think that um, pictures and multimedia, as we're moving into that, um, interviewing and doing a, um, a video uh, of your family reunion and with little short spots and things like that, those more tangible things mm-hmm. are easier for the non-genealogist to relate to. And so I think it's our responsibility to bring notes and genealogy and everything up to the current standards so we're not just on paper anymore right but but still scanning the documents so that we have the source documents attached to each ancestor the backup yeah the backup part of it that what it was we used to arrive at our lineage assumptions is how i put it <laughs> yes but um but i think we have to do the fluff side of it kind of don't you think i think so i mean um it's like i think we need to have fun with it 
Yes. And is Enjoy genealogy it? supposed to be fun? I, it's hard. I was afraid I was going to rock some worlds when I did my first, you know, <laughs> silly our our summer vacation and showed what a lunatic I can be at the Family History oh. Library. But, you know, what was so funny was it rang just true for so many people. Oh yes. my gosh, have I been like? And I think. Um, I know my kids have often thought, oh, that's mom, she's doing her genealogy, yes. boring, boring, boring. And my daughter who just got married, I think I mentioned this in one of my recent episodes, she sat down, she had just finished a novel about a woman who had been a nurse, and she became a nurse in the 30s, and how different it was back then. Mm-hmm. And she says, did, did somebody in our family nurse? I said, yes, yes. great grandmother. She says, well, could I borrow this book? Now, this book has been on our coffee table for three years. Mm-hmm. But she picked it up, and she read it. You never know when they're going to be bit by that That's genealogy right. book. And to start, because I, th- I think she's actually thinking about, when will my children come? Mm-hmm. And now... It it's matters. more realistic to the forefront. Yeah, that's true. I think that... Um, you also have to be willing to take calls on the fly. I can remember I was bringing my dad home from dinner one evening, and I got a call on the cell phone, and so, of course, I pulled off the road because I'm obedient to Good. the laws of the land. But anyway, and she said, quick, give us an ancestor story. And I'm like, okay, and, you know, you got stories up your sleeve. There's almost any time of year, any season, growing things, I said jamming, weddings, funerals, like there's an unusual story in our family about how this woman died, this is my grandmother Frances, and her obituary and her death certificate have the wrong birth year because she married a second time. And she, and she made my mother swear she would never tell him <laughs> that she was as old as she was. Oh, wow. You know, once you're over whatever, yeah, it doesn't matter cares? anymore. But, um, you know, that was kind of funny, a funny little story. And so you got to have those little s- stories. I think that's why it's more than just names and dates and places. Right. We're collecting the story behind, stand who they are, put them in historical perspective. Exactly. And human. Humanize them, yeah. Myrtle was your grandmother, is that where you got the name? Yep, on my dad's side, that's his mother, Myrtle Weiser, player, was her first married name, Severinsen, after she was widowed, she married Grandpa Severinsen. Right. And she's the one that taught me to make the jam. Oh. What is, would, maybe you could share just a quick little story, what's your favorite Myrtle story? <laughs> I'll tell you, she's a very smart woman. She didn't um, ever really discipline us. She always made us feel welcome. But one time, I guess she needed to get some things done in the house, so she decided to have me paint the front steps on the porch. It's one of Grandpa Harold Severinsen's great big heavy paint brushes, a house painting brush, which for a five-year-old or four-year-old took both hands. Right. And a bucket of water. And what happens when you have, yes, smart. (laughs) When you have green wooden painted steps and you brush them with water, they look a dark green and very glistening and bright. And you start at the top, you go down, the top needs it again. That kept me busy for hours. <laughs> what a brilliant woman. Yes, smart gal. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's for sure. Thank you so much. It has just been my greatest pleasure to get a chance to finally meet you face to face. And I'm me just too. counting on that there's going to be lots and lots more time. Well, to do thanks that. so much. <laughs> we enjoyed it. Thanks, darling. Okay, bye. brings us to the close of another episode of Genealogy Gems podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time out today. I know that there's a lot of stuff that pushes and pulls you through the week and that can grab your attention. And I feel very honored and blessed that you invest some of your precious time with me here. Um, It's a joy to talk about genealogy and family history. And I hope that you are enjoying the show. At any time, feel free to drop me a line at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com. Of course, I encourage you to um, subscribe to the free newsletter. You can find all of that at the website. And uh, now that I'm back home and getting my bearings again, I'll hopefully get some new videos up there for you as well and some other new content. So be checking back. There's new things all the time. 
But in the meantime, have a terrific week. Can you kind of feel fall in the air? I feel it out here. It's a little chilly in the morning, but uh, lovely afternoons here in California. And I, I hope it's lovely at your home. Have a wonderful week. And I will talk to you soon. 